It ain't the left side or the right side. Then it must be the fence side. Thank you, Solo D. Welcome to another episode of On the Fin Side with Brian Cat Cat and Zero and Paul Pickett, where we are going to talk and take a deep dive into everything that you need to know about the Miami Dolphins and free agency heading up. We are going to go through who the Dolphins free agents are. We're also going to talk about the top five needs in terms of position. We're going to talk about our the top five players that Paul and I would want if money were no object, which we know that it is, and also a couple of sleepers along the way. So, Paul, here we are kind of on uh, <laughs> one of a few Christmas Eves throughout the NFL calendar. Yeah, man, it's – it's uh, I I get so weirded out by the fact that we actually have a period of time that I can't even remember the real name of at this point because we all refer to it as the legal tampering period which is just goofy as all hell to me. I, I, I can't say it without just looking at it funny because of the word tampering. But I'm absolutely excited, man. It, it, you know me, you know you. The off season is just so much fun to cover. It, it's really a, just a, a puzzle piece after puzzle piece move. And I'm excited, man. I can't wait. Me too. And, yeah, it's very uh, oxymoron-like on Tuesday and Wednesday where it's a legal tampering period where – for those who, who aren't clear about that, the players can talk to the different teams and it's not going to be held against them. And then we typically hear a lot of times uh, who's going to sign where, especially guys among the top 25 to 30 free agents out there in the NFL. And then on Thursday, the paperwork really becomes legal. And usually by this time next week, we're going to have a pretty good idea of who went where. So that's what we're going to dig into a little bit here tonight. So to take a look at the, where the Dolphins are in terms of their free agents, they have a number of them, uh, not anything that, that jumps out like last year where at this time we were looking at, okay, Olivier Vernon, Lamar Miller, Richard Matthews, pretty big names for the Dolphins. Uh, not quite as extensive this year. The two big names that are expected to hit the market are wide receiver Kenny Stills and defensive end Andre Branch. After that, uh, the second tier of players – You've got tight end Deion Sims, linebacker Jelani Jenkins, guard Jermon Bushrod. And then really that third tier, we don't ex- players we don't expect back, may or may not be with another roster here throughout the year. Quarterback TJ Yates, tight end Jordan Cameron, tight end Dominique Jones, uh, linebacker Spencer Paysinger, linebacker Donald Butler, safety Bakari Rambo, and long snapper John Denny. So uh, a lot of names out there, some more important than others. But Paul and I – talk before being on the show about really what our top five needs are for the Dolphins. Funny enough, three, four, and five were the same for us. One and two were dissimilar. And because I host the show, I'm going to start out with my top need for the Miami Dolphins, and that is defensive end, where currently on the roster, the Dolphins have pretty slim pickings right now. Cameron Wake, Terrence Fade as your starting defensive end. You've got Deion Jordan, in the mix somewhere, it's undetermined whether or not Deion Jordan is going to be able to contribute this year or if he's going to be cut and the Dolphins save a little bit of money. Uh, Andre Branch, really that unrestricted free agent. And, Paul, it seems like Branch is becoming more and more important uh, as we approach the hours heading into free agency. Oh, he completely is. I mean, if they're not able to come to some sort of terms with him over over the next day or two, which – Let's face it, a lot of teams, once the pressure gets on, a lot of players, once the pressure gets on, that's when you see a lot of quick closure deals happening. But I, I don't know if we're going to see that with, with Branch and, and and a couple of the other guys here because so many teams have such big cap space this year that we may see a chance where Andre Branch doesn't resign, but he ends up resigning eventually once he goes out and tests the market, sees what the numbers are, and, and, and really makes that decision as to whether Miami's where he wants to be, if he wants to continue in this defense that should be pretty similar stylistically this year, and, and playing opposite Cameron Wake. So there's there's a lot of balls in the air with that. But they Miami really needs to either resign this guy, or for me, there's only two other guys on the market that I'm drooling over as potential starters that are in a realistic price range. I love Calais Campbell. He loves Arizona, and he's going to be a $12 million a year player. I, just, I don't want to pay that for that guy. Um, 
So for me, if they don't re-sign Branch, they've got to make a strong push for a guy like Sheard or Dayton Jones. Uh, those those are really the only two I could see coming in and admirably filling that spot. But don't forget also, like we've talked about, we want to see Cameron Wake end up more situationally pass rushing than anything else. And we'll need another starter on that side in front of him, not named Terrence Fide. Yeah, and that's the point here is that Cameron Wake is 35 years old, and if he's going to see that two-year contract extension, he can't be playing 50 or 55 snaps a game. I mean, we want him firing off the edge for 30 or 35 so that he is that you know 10-plus sack guy every year, and he's a terror on passing down. So, yeah, you're right, Paul, is even if the Dolphins re-sign Andre Branch, which is going to come at a hefty price, probably – six to eight million dollars a year which i feel is necessary at this point the dolphins are still probably going to have to add one or two are definitely going to have to add one or two more defensive ends along the way to draw a comparison out there in the market william golston re-signed with the bucks five years 27 and a half million and that has the potential with incentives to move up to 36 million and our listeners are probably thinking who And that'd be exactly right. I mean, I would put Andre Branch actually above William Golston in terms of talent, Paul. I think a lot of people would. And one of the things that I know we'll get into these guys in a little bit, but one of the things that Miami should look at here as well, given another need that I'm sure we might be talking about as we move forward, is there are a handful of guys listed at defensive tackle out there that actually have some positional flexibility, especially given a 4-3 or a 3-4 but with Miami running the 4-3, that could kick out to defensive end on first and second down and kick inside on third and fourth down, really filling two needs uh, with with one salary. So, I mean, there, there's a lot of different things. A guy like Jared Odrick, who I know a lot of Dolphin fans are familiar with, and even Tony McDaniel, who was with the Dolphins before, could come in, play a little bit of defensive end on the early downs, a little D-tackle on third and fourth down, and, and, and really be – a big need filler for this team uh, at two positions. Yeah, and at defensive end, it's it's an interesting market because you do have some players like Carl Klug and Jared Odrick who can't play defensive end in a pinch. Uh, in terms of that pure defensive end, like an Andre Branch is, yeah. other than Branch, I, I had three or four players listed above him um, in the free agent market, and partially because we saw Jason Pierre-Paul, Melvin Ingram – get the franchise tag. So it really uh, eliminated the market. And Mario Addison, also from the Panthers, signed a three or $22 million uh, contract with them too, took hit market too. So really you've got Calais Campbell, Nick Perry, Jabal Shear, Dayton Jones. Then you've got Andre Branch. And, and then you have a few other players like Devin Taylor from the Lions, Alex Okafer from the Cardinals and Charles Johnson from the Panthers. But after that, the market really starts to drop off. So I don't think the Dolphins have much of a choice but to re-sign Andre Branch unless his numbers get into that eight, nine, ten million dollar a year range, at which point you may as well just throw everything at the at the wall for Calais Campbell. Yeah, and and for me it's kind of funny. As much as I love Calais Campbell, as much as he'd be on uh, a money is no object wish list for me. I look at those five guys I mentioned and after them, as far as regular playing time players. I'm essentially looking at the draft as guys that could fill that defensive end need in some way, shape, or form. There's a lot I'm not thrilled with, a lot of aging players. And other than those, so if we count Calais six, the NFL draft is the only other place I see that's going to truly fill the need for this team. Yeah, it's uh, defensive end. I tell you, in the NFL draft, we're going to talk about that in the upcoming weeks. I see a good 13 or 14 defense edge rushers that are, going to go, that are going to go in the first two rounds of the draft. So the Dolphins do have that opportunity to fill that need in free agency too. And it's pretty predictable that someone's going to be there in the first and second round. Maybe that enters into their strategy. Uh, but Calais Campbell, one thing that intrigues me about him is, is his scheme flexibility. So he can put, be a 4-3 defensive end, and he is fast enough to do that. He can move inside next to Indomitian and Sue on passing downs, which would be a nightmare with Sue, Calais Campbell, and Cameron Wake on the field at the same time. But he is going to cost, my guess is between 10 and $12 million a year. Uh, Campbell is going to be 31 years old right before this season starts here. But 
when I look at him, he's somebody I'd be more willing to invest in because of his size, even because if you think about it, yeah, he's, he is going to be 31 years old, but his speed is not going to deteriorate. He's going to be six, eight, 300 pounds here in a couple of years too. So he's somebody very high on my wish list, which we'll get back to a little bit later. Paul, and, and looking at these defensive ends, not a lot of meat on the bone after you get past the first seven or eight guys. Maybe somebody like Jack Crawford from the Cowboys, Cornelius Washington from the Bears, but I don't see them being anything more than number four defensive ends uh, if the Dolphins are going to have a good unit. Paul, uh, let's move on to your biggest need as well, the offensive guard spot. This was number two for me, number one for you. I could have very easily put it number one myself. Currently on the roster in those starting spots with Tunzel kicking out the left tackle, we have Craig Urbick and we have Anthony Steen and then nobody. So it is barren fruit at a very important guard position on this offense, Paul. There's so many things I want to say about this position. I mean, for, first and foremost, it's the defensive end position is completely barren for this team right now, given that Andre Branch is not under contract. But I still couldn't put it above offensive guard, even though my brain kept flirting with the idea, because... Let's face it, Craig Urbic, Anthony Steen, they had their admirable moments. I like the positional flexibility that they can move to center when Mike Pouncey gets injured for six or seven games again this year. Normally, you can look at a, at a couple of these guys and say, okay, you've got a future pro bowler at left tackle in Laramie Tunzel. You've got a very good right tackle in Jawan James. You've got a pro bowl center in the middle of this, this offensive line. You can patch in some slightly below average guards and still get the job done because of what's around them. Unfortunately, given the fact that Pouncey does have that chronic hip issue and is a guy that's going to miss five plus games a season, you really need better offensive guard play than you would given a durable, healthy center that was pro bowl caliber, because they're not going to be able to count on having him next to them for that many games. So you need to go out and look at some of the better guards on the market. Luckily, the free agent crop this year is a very, very good crop of guards. I don't see Miami going out and signing a guy that I know is on your wish list and mine in, in Zeitler because one of the reasons they parted ways with Brandon Albert was they felt that they could get cheaper on the offensive line and improve the offensive line at the same time. You don't cut a guy that was eight and a half, nine million and go out and sign one that's 10 million and call it cheaper. You just don't. So Zeitler's going to see 10 million on the market easily at this point. So he's probably out of the equation. You look at a guy like Lang, he might actually be that nine or $10 million a year guard. So really you've got to look at your three, four and five on the list and nail at least one of these guys which would be a Warford, a uh, Chance Warmack, or a Leary. One of those three has to be a signing for this team going into free agency. At that point, you can look at what I, I refer to in, on, on my notes anyway as, as the Group C offensive guards out there because you do want to get a veteran in there. Maybe go a little bit younger for some of these guys and, and pull somebody in that could, could fill the need and, and potentially grow into being something. Maybe you bring back a bush rod and have him plug in because he did do an admirable job last year. But you look at a guy like Bushrod or Watford, or I can't even, I know I'm getting this wrong, Omame. That's, that's, that's uh, close enough. <laughs> or, or Abushi, uh, one of those guys to come in and, and, and fill that gap as well. You do that, and suddenly you've got a very good offensive line, and you can focus most of your effort on, on, on filling some of the other needs out there. I don't like the idea of drafting an offensive guard. Their needs on defense are too high. Maybe a project pick with one of those fifth rounders that you think could be developmental. I'd be fine with that. But as far as your starters on that offensive line, you need to protect Tannehill and you need to be able to keep Jay Ajayi running downfield. To do that, you've got to have good guard play and Miami needs to go out and get some, get a couple of veterans, even if they're not the top-tier guys, and bring them in here to, to, to fill those holes. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right in terms of how the Dolphins will approach this. I, I don't think they're going to go out and spend anywhere north of $8 million on a guard. And, and that at that point, it eliminates Kevin Zeitler from the Bengals, TJ Lang from the Packers, Larry Warford probably as well from the Lions. 
uh, it, it takes them off the list. And But I think that's a mistake. And, and I'll tell you why, because for me, the Dolphins have a rare opportunity to, in a league that's so bad at offensive line across the board and is so important in the NFL, to really build an A unit. And I think this need, this the offensive line is the position on the Dolphins that needs to be an A unit for two reasons. Number one, Ryan Tannehill plays well when he's protected well, and it matters to him more than a lot of other quarterbacks, too. I mean, it's one thing for Phillip Rivers or Tom Brady to have a bad offensive line. Yeah, they just move protection, get rid of the ball quickly. Tannehill doesn't play that way. And, because, and if we've seen the guard play with Dallas Thomas and Jason Fox and a tackle with Jason Fox, we've seen that ruin the season and ruin games before. But overall, yeah, I, I think you're right that that was the strategy, that they're going to cut Albert, they're going to move Tunzel to left tackle, they're going to go cheaper at guard, and everything's going to be okay. Um, I, I think that's a risky proposition. One player that does interest me is Luke Jogel from the Jaguars. He started to play better um, after moving from left tackle, where he was the number two overall pick, to left guard. He's 25 years old. You know he's at least going to be a good pass protector and do well, or and, and in a pitch be able to move out to that left tackle spot. And then after that, yeah, you do have a few players that you can really just plug in in the free agent market. Patrick Omama, I'm pretty sure I'm saying that correctly. From the Jaguars, you talked about Ode Abushi from the, the Texans. Uh, Stefan Wisniewski from the Jaguars, too. I mean, they're just having a fire sale here with their cards. Um, <laughs> could be an interesting proposition, too. But uh, overall, I, I you look at Ryan Tannehill and how he needs to be protected and how important that is. And then you look at Jay Ajayi. When he got, finally, when he got the run blocking, he ran for 200 yards three different times. It would be a shame that if Jay Ajayi averaged, you know, 3.8, 3.9 yards a carry next year because you don't have the guard play inside. And then you factor in Mike Pouncey, too. I mean, Pouncey may be a Pro Bowl center, but we at this point can't count on him to be that center uh, that, that stays on the field for 16 games. Yeah, and, and, and one of the things you, I think you hit the nail on the head there is you really need the offensive line play to be an A. You look at teams like the Cowboys and the Falcons – probably arguably the two best offensive lines in the league right now. Look what they were able to do this past year. It really opened a lot up for both their teams. On top of that, when you have a running back that has Jay Ajayi's style of running and you've got these, these guards and tackles and, and center that can open up to the point where suddenly Ajayi is getting to the second level. Ajayi against nearly anyone at the second, third level one-on-one is a mismatch. He can go around them and he can go over them. And the fact that he can go around them makes it even more effective when he can go over them. If he gets that one-on-one matchup, at worst, he's falling forward 95 times out of 100. And falling forward as a running back is never a bad thing. So really what that opens up for this team, as well as what it will do for the defense, because being able to move that ball well can turn the other team's offense one-dimensional. We saw it happen against the Dolphins where they got turned one-dimensional when the other team was able to move the balls, ball effectively. Why not set it up so that Miami can do the same thing and improve their defense because of their offensive play based around the offensive line? This is such a critical spot, and that's why, for me, this is the number one need going into the offseason. Paul, moving on to our number three need, and that's linebacker. Currently on the roster, uh, Kiko Alonso, who the Dolphins are currently talking with, according to reports, uh, about a contract extension, which I think is a good move. Uh, you've got Koamisi technically on the team, but Koamisi is mulling or is either going to be released or there's a possibility with his neck he could actually retire as well. That after that, you've got Neville Hewitt, who's shown some promise, as well as uh, the poor man Zach Thomas and, and Mike Hall. So. One or two players definitely needed here in, in free agency. And the Dolphins do have some free agents of their own here at linebacker. Jelani Jenkins, Spencer Pacinger, and Butler, too. Uh, I would be surprised if Jenkins or Butler were back. Spencer Pacinger, I'd love to have back on a cheap deal for special teams reasons. Looking at the linebacker spot, Paul Kiko wants to stay inside, but is open to playing outside linebacker. 
too. So now, you know, it, it's all encompassing here at linebacker because it could be middle linebacker, could be outside linebacker with Kiko staying inside. I'd prefer for Kiko to move outside. And it's a pretty good market, too. You've got Dante Hightower, Zach Brown, Kevin Minter, Lawrence Timmons, as well as some depth uh, as well and in, in some of these these the players around the league, Paul. What do you think? Yeah, for for me, you, you're going to notice probably at some point there's there's a pretty big theme to to my players at each of these positions, which the vast majority of the players that that I have on my list are all on the the good side of thirty at this point. Uh, I think if you're going to add in free agency, you want to add the guys in for the most part that you're looking to fill a gap long term. Uh, occasionally, you want to have a one year, two year plug and play which that's when you look at the, the north of 30 guys. But for the most part, from as far as I'm concerned, a guy like Dante Hightower, they're not going to pay him to come to Miami. They're not going to pay him what he's worth in this market. They're not going to pay him in, in what he's worth in terms of the fact that the linebacker crop gets very thin very quickly this offseason. So he's going to command an even bigger price tag, an even bigger cap number. And, and that's just not something I see happening. I could see Minter being a guy that could come in and fill the the role very well, and we'd be just as happy as we would with Hightower. I think he'd be a very good fit in this, in this defense. And then I look at guys like Zach Brown and Lorenzo Alexander. I, I, I'm completely intrigued by them as well. But I hope Kiko is open to the kick outside uh, if need be. I think he's a better player out there. But some of that's going to also depend schematically for this team on what they do at defensive tackle. Because if they do get a space eater defensive tackle that keeps Kiko running free at middle linebacker, I have a lot less problem with him at middle linebacker and, and, and a lot less worry. And it gives the Dolphins a lot more flexibility. So there's a lot of different positions that are going to affect what I'd like to see them do at linebacker. As far as depth per- perspective goes, guys like CO, guys like Gerald Hodges, AJ Klein, and Sean Spence. Uh, C.O.B. and C.O. Moore, those could all be guys that come in with the potential to unseat for that starting role. They've got unseat, un, unrealized potential and things like that, but could also provide some serious quality depth for this team as well. So they, they'd be a flexible piece that could be used either way. Yeah, we're definitely on the same page with this unit. I don't see them signing Dante Hightower. Uh, if they were to pay somebody like him, yeah, you know, twelve or thirteen million a year. I think that would be a mistake. Nothing against Hightower; he's a fantastic player. But with that money, I would prefer that that were to be spent on a unit and on a player that is really hard to find. And I don't think Hightower is a, a generational type of talent, uh, and that's what type of money that I would want to spend on a player like that. Yeah, and you know, Zach Brown, Kevin Minter. Good players, um, you know, for the right price, I'd consider them. But if eight, nine million a year is that right price, then I'm not interested. And yeah, I, I look at the rest of this unit and I, I pl- I'll pluck just two players out of here. Gerald Hodges from the 49ers and Perry Riley from the Raiders. If, if you took these two free agents who are probably going to be, you know, somewhere around three to five million a year and you insert them into the starting lineup, you kick Kiko to the outside You still have the draft to maybe add somebody else. I I think that's the best move because you can upgrade two important linebacker positions on your team and you're not spending a whole heck of a lot of money doing it. Yeah, and and, uh, I'm amazed, Kat. Neither one of us went out and said, Miami needs to go out and sign Kelvin Shepard this offseason because, you know, I I thought for sure at least one of (laughs) us was going to be in that boat uh, given the lack of much that he gave us for a couple of years not that long ago. But, no, it's it's – it's definitely an intriguing position. It's definitely a very deep position in the draft, and that might be where Miami finds the answer for at least one of those two starting linebackers. I don't see Koamisi's neck allowing him to be that that player for the Dolphins next year if he's even able to be an NFL player next year. And it's a shame because he was a solid player, if not a spectacular one, that really could have thrived in this defense. But you have to be able to stay on the field to do so and to help the team and, and he just can't do that, unfortunately. Yeah, I always defended Co as Co as a player because I thought he was at worst solid, and I thought too if he were given more opportunities to rush the pass, passer like he did at Utah, we would have seen a a guy that made more plays. But it is what it is. Now we're talking about somebody who's almost thirty one years old, has neck problems, 
has really his stock has been pointing down for a couple of years now. So we'll see if the Dolphins are able to get those linebacker spots figured out. Uh, Paul, number four here, and you know, you, you and I, you know, could, could have put linebacker, our defensive tackle, three or four. So we're we'll move on to defensive tackle. Currently on the roster, you know, this it looks good in the the first two, especially based on potential, and Dominican Sue and, and Jordan Phillips. After that, you've got Nick Williams and Julius Wormsley, as well some young players with with some potential maybe to to make a roster spot, but. I see this really as a unit that the Dolphins can upgrade to, like linebacker, uh, because of the depth at that position and, and because of the need. Um, it, you almost would have to try to not get a player that's going to be an upgrade over what Earl Mitchell was. There are at least 11, 12 guys hitting for agency that are going to be better than Earl Mitchell, one of which, two of which could be Jared Odrick and Paul Soliai if the Dolphins are to look in that direction. The word is right now that they're not, but. You never know. And looking at this market, Paul, three guys really stick out. Young, good players. Brandon Williams from the Ravens, Don Terry Poe from the Chiefs, Jonathan Hankins from the Giants. We've talked about, you know, the Dolphins may not spend a whole heck of a lot of money here, may may do so at this position, at that position. Do you think defensive tackle with Brandon Williams and Poe and Hankins and these types of players hitting the market, do you think this is uh, this is a position the Dolphins are going to consider putting all their chips in for? I think it's a position they don't have to put all their chips in for just because of the reason you just mentioned. I, I think with, with Brandon Williams hitting the market, with Don Terry Poe hitting the market, I think those two are going to command a ridiculous salary. And to be honest, I, I do like Jordan Phillips being out there on first and second down next to Ndamukong Sue. I don't think Miami needs to pump the Brandon Williams, Dontari Poe money into the defensive tackle position. You're basically trying to bring in somebody that's that you're battling for the same snaps for in that scenario. What I'd like to see is I'd like to see Miami go out and and, and do what I hinted about earlier in terms of that defensive tackle, defensive end flexibility. Those guys like Audric McDaniel, Calais Campbell, or if they are going to go for that plugger and and, and and do so, those guys might be cheap because of the fact that these other guys are, are sucking up the big salary moves to some teams. Then you look at guys like Nick Fairley. Uh, Jonathan Hankins, he could be in that big salary. He could be in that medium salary range. It, it really depends on what these teams out there do. But he's another guy, like you said, that I'd look at. Uh, Benny Logan's one I would look at here, as well as Alan Branch, Paul Soliai, Akeem Spence. Guys that are going to be able to spell Indomitian Sue on occasion, but predominantly Jordan Phillips, so we can keep him fresh and effective throughout games because he has shown the ability, if he gains the consistency, to take over in some scenarios. So they just need to figure out the best way to deploy these guys. So having that, that defensive end hybrid might be the way to go here. The defensive tackle is a position I would strongly consider, again, throwing a lot of money at with these players at the top, depending on the value. And I'll tell you why, because you take Brandon Williams, Don Terry Poe, or Jonathan Hankins, I believe this is a position, a defensive tackle, that if you draft somebody, you're going to have another Jordan Phillips, a guy who's not quite there yet, where here you would have a finished product. Brandon Williams and Don Terry Poe, too, I don't know if they're going to cost that that eleven twelve million a year like a Dante Hightower will at linebacker because they really play two downs, but they dominate on those two downs and they dominate a defensive tackle position that other than Indomik and Sue, I believe has been a train wreck uh, over the last couple of years. Also, it allows Jordan Phillips to play like Cameron Wake thirty snaps a game or so and really focus on getting to the quarterback because we see Jordan Phillips just light it up for two or three drives a game, usually on pass downs. And then that goes away as the game progresses. Uh, if you put Brandon Williams in there next to Sue, I believe you had years on to Sue's career because he's going to be 30 this year. You allow, you allow yourself to take some time then with Jordan Phillips. And now you've taken a defensive tackle spot and you've taken it from one that besides Sue has been pretty soft. And now with Sue Williams and Phillips, you may have the best defensive tackle uh, trio in the league. Something I'd give some thought to, but you're right too, Paul, that at, at the defensive tackle spot, there is some depth. You've got Nick Fairley. You've got Jared Odrick out there again. You've got Paul Soliai. 
too, where, you know, Paul Sully I, is an example as well that if you can't stop the run and you are that, you can play into your mid-30s at a pretty high level. I wonder if Sully I would have another two, another year or two left to be able to play that big no, that big defensive tackle spot. Yeah, and, and bringing up Sully I too, the, the interesting thing with him – is he was always a big man with better speed than you expected and better pass rush ability than than you'd expect when when watching him play. He was that guy that came into the league raw and had a lot of learning to do. So bringing in a guy like him may be the best thing you could do to help Jordan Phillips on two fronts, whether it's knocking Jordan Phillips down to 30 snaps a game and keeping him fresh, but also having a similar player stylistically with a similar background in, in how he came up in the NFL, mentor Jordan Phillips. So you bring him in on a two, three-year contract, have him mentor Jordan Phillips, finish his career as a Dolphin. There's a lot of win-win still looking at a guy like Soliai here. So that may be the guy here that, that helps Jordan Phillips the most on multiple fronts and, and sets him up for when Soliai retires or moves on, when Indomitian and Sue eventually retires or moves on. Uh, so that could be a very interesting one to look at that wouldn't cost the team a huge amount of dollars. And Soli, I, yeah, in terms of his age, he's 33 years old. Can he give a few extra years or are we going to get him in here and the guy's just cooked? Um, that's where I think Brandon Williams, Don Terry Poe, Jonathan Hankins would make a lot of sense, even though you're, you'd be spending a lot of money at defensive tackle. But with Brandon Williams, a player like this, a guy that big, six, you know, six foot four, 360 pounds, Pro Bowl level space eater, uh, given that the Dolphins' run defense has been so bad. I, I say good luck at, at running the football against the Miami Dolphins if you've got Brandon Williams and Indama Kinsu inside. But, you know, it all depends on what these players want to. A lot, a lot of uh, chatter out there there at defensive tackle. You are listening to our free agent episode. I'm Paul Pickin, Brian Zero on the fin side. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, iTunes, YouTube. We're not hard to find. Uh, finally, Paul, the the fifth position that suddenly really has become a need for the Dolphins, and, and that's safety. Uh, Dolphins got some bad news with uh, Issa abdul Kadus. Their His season could be in question in, in 2017. He got hurt late in the 2016 season, right before the playoffs, could spill over into the 2017 season. But the Dolphins are still okay at their starting spots, at least to me. Paul's probably going to disagree with this. With Michael yeah. Thomas and Rashad Jones, I, I think Michael Thomas is is a mid level starter. Paul would probably put him a step below, and Rashad Jones coming back from injury. If he comes back and is healthy, you get a Pro Bowl level performer back there. Um, then again, at the other safety spot, Walt Aikens, uh, that third, it would be your third safety, and this is a player that the Dolphins didn't feel comfortable putting on the field here late in the year. Only wanted him to be on special teams. Uh, Bakari Rambo, Paul, and I can both agree is the uh, the only Dolphins free agent shouldn't be back anywhere near the building this this upcoming year. You know, Paul, uh, not a lot of top heavy talent here at the safety class, unless you consider Tony Jefferson, who is a strong safety, uh, one of those players. Uh, but a lot of depth here in the safety class here in free agency. Yeah, there's a, there's a few guys that intrigue me as far as depth players go, and. and... I'm a little different camp than you, as you alluded with Michael Thomas. I, I think he's an okay nickel and a damn good special teamer. But as far as he and Walt Aikens go, I don't want to see him ever sniff the field at safety. I want to see him come in and occasionally be the dime back, be the nickel back if, if Bobby McCain has to sit out for a couple of plays and, and then just be out there when Matt Dar's on the field or Andrew Franks at this point. Uh, beyond that, I, I, I don't want to see them anywhere between the sidelines uh, unless it's coming out to shake hands after the game. I would prefer them to Bakari Rambo or Donald Butler, though, so there is that in their favor. Uh, I'd also prefer you being out there to either of them or anybody Thanks, else man. being out there to either of them. Uh, you know, I, hey, I'm trying to get you the big money here. I think you could do a better job than Donald Butler and Bakari Rambo. I do look at there are some intriguing younger players that that are towards the bottom end of, of the free agency list for a lot of folks out there, but guys that had a lot more promise than they've delivered on thus far in their careers, and maybe that change of scenery will be something that helps them out. Guys like Micah Hyde, guys like Kamal Johnson, Chris Conte, Shamarco Thomas, who I cannot hear his name in my head without hearing Mike Mayock say it. Uh, 
basically because everything that year for the draft, Mike Mayock wasn't able to say a sentence without saying Shamarco Thomas's name. But these are some guys that really didn't live up to the hype, but they have that God-given raw ability. For me, I, I, I've made no secret of this, and, and, and the guy may have really put a, a kink in the chain for me in terms of being able to come to Miami. The guys that I'm looking at for, for potentially unseating IAQ or filling his role if he's on IR for next season are guys like Obi Melifonwu, guys in the draft here. The draft is very safety heavy, and I want to see Miami look that route for the guy that could be starting next to Rashad Jones next season. Because let's face it, free agency crop is full of thus far busts and not anyone that, that, that's got that full-on promise. So getting that starting safety is probably going to have to come from the draft, unfortunately. Yeah, I'd like for the Dolphins to look at, at safety in, in the second or third round if somebody uh, of value presents themselves. I, I think Obi is, after <laughs> running a 4-4 flat and uh, a 44-inch jump, I think he's now elevated himself into the first round. But if he ends up you know, toward the bottom end of the second, I think that's a great steal. You know, if somebody like Marcus May from Florida finds himself at the bottom of the third round, I think he would be a good starter long term too. And you know, even the, the Dolphins. So if Issa can't come back, it's a pretty scary proposition because, yeah, you're going to have to fill free safety somewhere because you're going to at least need some backups, even if you think highly of Michael Thomas manning that position. But in the future, I mean, Rashad Jones is 29 years old this year, going to be 30 after the season, heading to free agency. And and I, I'm also of the belief, too, with Rashad Jones, I would not resign him long term, even though he's been a great player for this reason. I, I think that once this guy hits 30 years old, he loses that step, that burst. He's not cerebral enough to stick around the league till he's 32, 33, 34 years old, and he's going to be done, and we're still going to be paying him. So. Looking at at the safety class, it seems like there are a lot of in the box safeties here, which should not attract the Dolphins at all. Tony Jefferson from the Cardinals, Barry Church from the Cowboys, T.J. McDonald from the Rams, Deron Harmon from the Patriots, John Cyprian from the Jags, D.J. Swearinger, J.J. Wilcox, Brad McDougal, all these guys in the box safeties. Uh, actually, been McDougal, I don't think is, but really eight of the top nine guys are so. Now you start getting down to the bottom of the list. Maybe along the way you add a player like a Shamarco Thomas, like you said, Paul. Maybe a Chris Conte from the Bucks. Maybe a Kelsey McCray from the Seahawks, who used to play for the Dolphins. But I think you're looking strictly at depth if you're going to approach this in free agency. Maybe you'll look at the position in rounds three or round five, five with one-year picks. So we've gone over all of our needs, Paul. Defensive end, guard, linebacker. D tackle safety. So here's the question now, Paul. If money were no object and you could pluck one guy off this free agent, one guy away from this free agency class and put him on the Dolphins roster, who would that be? Calais Campbell, without a doubt. Money is no object. He's automatically here if I say so. Calais Campbell. Uh, he, he is the ultimate piece that fills two needs for the Dolphins. He can be that guy that keeps Cam Wake off the field on first and second down, and he can be that guy that fills Jordan Phillips' spot along the defensive line on, on third and fourth down if need be. Uh, he can kick inside. He can kick outside. He's a monster. He could be a space eater, and he can rush the passer. He's a complete player and fills two needs. Calais Campbell, hands down, even though it's my number two position on the need list. Yeah, and Calais Campbell is number one for me, too, uh, and – a former Miami Hurricane too, but you're right. Is he could be a first down defensive end, and then on on passing downs, move inside. He also gives the Dolphins potential scheme flexibility if they want to go in that direction too. Then after that, uh, I, two through five, Paul, I'll go through my list here as well. Number two is Kevin Zeitler. Uh, like you talked about before, it reminds me of back in 2000. I think it was 12 when Marshall Yonda hit the free agency market. And I said I would pay him an outrageous amount of money. I think I'd said like $8 million at the time, which would be about $11 million today. And people said, oh, I'm not paying that for a guard. Well, here Marshall Yonda is still five years later playing right guard for the Ravens at a Pro Bowl level. Uh, I think Zeitler would be the same thing. He's 26 going on 27. Great player in high school. Great player at Wisconsin for four years. 
was a first round pick. He's become a great player for the Bengals. You know what you're getting. And to me, it takes this offensive line for the long term from a unit that has some uncertainty, especially in the interior and, and makes this a B plus or an A unit moving forward. And I think that's so important for this offense with Tannehill and with Jay Ajayi, uh, the players that, that he's going to be paving the way for. Uh, third would be Dante Hightower. Um, and I don't expect the Dolphins to pay the money for him, but somebody in the middle of your defense who is a former first round pick can do it all, has great pass instincts, uh, a great blitzer, not that generational type of linebacker like a Patrick Willis, but really a step below on that too. But overall, I don't see the Dolphins paying the money for him. Number four and five are, for reasons we alluded to, or that I alluded to, Brandon Williams and Dante Repo. You put them in there, space eaters, and you know what you're getting out of these players. And again, I think by getting a defensive tackle of this caliber, you're going to add another year onto the career of Indomitian Sue and Cameron Wake. And I, that's, there's nothing more important than that right now on this defense that needs a lot of players. Paul, so looking at the rest of your list, you said Calais Campbell as your top guy. Who would round out that list? Who are a few other players, if money were no object, that you would prefer? Uh, for me, the number two there would be Zeitler, just for all the reasons that you mentioned uh, and all the reasons that we talked about earlier at the offensive guard spot. Number four or number three for me would probably be, I'd have to say it would be, uh, Larry Warford of the Lions. I, I know TJ Lang's ranked a little higher by a lot of folks. I just think Larry Warford fits schematically better with the Dolphins, and he's three years younger. So suddenly you've got four guys along that offensive line at this point that are all 27 or younger heading into the season and makes Pouncey the old man on the line. And, hey, he's even got the hip, hip issues to match. Unfortunately, I'd probably even <laughs> fill out the offensive line even further here. and. I hate to say it, but I'd let Pouncey go or trade him away and pick up Nick Mangold. Do I think Pouncey's a better center, all things being equal, and then playing over 16 games? Yes, I do. But unfortunately, I think Nick Mangold is the guy that comes in and gives you 16 games a year as opposed to Pouncey's 11. So you average that out. The, the effectiveness over the course of the season is better having, having a guy like Mangold in there. And then finally, I'm going to completely go – total homer here and, and bring back one of our own and Kenny Stills man bring it bring it back what he adds to the top end of this offense that opens things up for the rest of it is is just I want to see him back in that Dolphins uniform Kenny Stills it's yeah I mean I, I'm thinking at the end of the day when you look at these teams out there that have receiver needs like, like the Browns who have over literally I'm not joking here over a hundred million dollars in cap room yeah, it's it's going to be tough to get him back. Uh, my my rule for this is is as follows: that when it comes to Kenny Stills, you cannot have Kenny Stills and Jarvis Landry long term. If you do that, it's a stupid move. Very simply because the Dolphins don't win through their wide receiver position. They win when they win up front. They win when they're winning the turnover battle, not specifically with wide receivers. Um, and speaking of wide receivers, Paul. Um, Something that I meant to bring up at the beginning of the show, there was a word out here today that from Jeff McLean from the Philadelphia Inquirer that Jarvis Landry, he speculated, I'm, I'm not trying to create a panic here, he speculated that Jarvis Landry, don't be surprised if he ends up on the trade block. Uh, are you buying this? And if, if so, would you hypothetically trade Jarvis Landry for the number 14th pick in the draft? Um, well, I know we had the question come in from Josh Hoadley today around that, if there's any truth to it. There's nothing that I don't think either of us has heard out, out of the Dolphins camp around this. Uh, if if that is the case, it's one of the best kept secrets ever. Uh, I think it's just exactly what we see a lot, both ourselves from, from Dolphins fans, from Dolphins beat writers. Sometimes we put out there, I think it's a speculative, God, I love this player. God, I wish we could get him. You know, maybe we could offer this up and 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 get it. Um, and, and this comes from the Philly side of the house, not from the Dolphins side of the house. This comes from a writer out there, not from the team itself. This this is just unsubstantiated, speculative. Hmm, wouldn't this be nice as, as a moment from from the writer? And and sure, 
you know, there, there's there's always talk from every side about a number of players. We, we've seen a number of people speculate on the possibility of Odell Beckham coming to the Dolphins eventually to pair up with Jarvis Landry, even though there's been nothing from the Giants camp about ever wanting to part ways with the guy and why would there be? So, yeah, take it for what it's worth. This is the off season. This is where rumors get started every which way and everywhere. I don't see any fact to this rumor. I think it would take a hell of a lot to pry Jarvis Landry away from the Dolphins. You and I have been inside the team facility, and the one name, even during his rookie year, that you hear everyone in the building say positive things about, no matter what, even unprompted, has has been Jarvis Landry since he got drafted. Paul, Paul I'm gonna I'm gonna cut you off and go back to the original question. I. I... I know it's speculation. I know it's bullshit. Right. Uh, no, no, no doubt about that. You know that too. My question is, hypothetically, if the Eagles were to right. offer the 14th pick in the draft to the Dolphins for Jarvis Landry, would you do that? No, I would. And I, I again, I don't think it'll happen. And that's that's really that's really uh, <laughs> all the time that we're going to spend on the actual rumor itself. It it, it is. BS. And if it happens, I think that Jeff McClain just got lucky by speculating that. But me personally, yeah. um, I, I would I would trade Landry, I would re-sign Kenny Stills, and I would take that first pick and use it on defense. And a lot of people say, well, you know, Landry's the lifeblood of the team. I, I think that's a pretty big exaggeration. And, and I'll tell you why, because Jarvis Landry, the last 10 games in which he's caught eight balls or more, the Miami Dolphins have lost that game. And it seems like Ajaye, Devontae, Parker, Kenny Stills, these are the guys making plays when the Dolphins are winning, not not Jarvis Landry. But, again, I love Jarvis Landry. You, as a Dolphins fan, you'd have to be on drugs not to like, like this guy and what he brings to the team. And after the catch, might be the best player in the NFL. I mean, uh, that, that goes for something. But, yeah, I, I think at the end of the day, uh, Jarvis Landry is going to ask for and get from somebody – 12 or 13 million a year. And at that point I tap out. I mean, to be quite honest, but I am one of probably a very, very, very small minority of Dolphins fans that would agree to that. Well, Kat, judging off our last five minutes, our starting receivers next year are going to be Leonte Carew and Jakeem Grant. If, if you get your way. And Devante and Devante Parker. Uh, and I I, again, I, I think, I think to, so, so Parker, Stills, Carew, and Grant. Uh, I, I think re-signing Stills would have to be part of any any idea. But anyway, we we've talked a little bit I've... too much about this, Paul. Let's getting back to free agency. Is there anybody on uh, hitting free agency that you know? I, I, I don't know if they're necessarily a sleeper, but a player that we haven't discussed yet that may interest you. Um, that may interest me. I kind of poke Pierre Garçon with a stick. I know he's 31 years old, but he's he's been one of those hell of an under-the-radar players throughout the years. He's a guy that if they lose Kenny Stills, might be a little cheaper because he's on the wrong side of 30, can come in and fill that need for a year or two while we wait and see if Devontae Parker develops into the player that he could develop into but hasn't become yet. I, I don't think it's any secret that the team's not 100%. Sure, if he's going to develop into that player at this point, they're you know, Gavin Gase has put some stuff out there. We've all watched it. There were four or five interceptions last year that Ryan Tannehill had that were directly attributable to a lack of effort on his part. And, and so, really, I hope Parker turns into that guy that we're de- debating this whole contract scenario with in a couple of years. He's not there yet. And Pierre Garcon could be that guy to come in and bridge the gap while we figure that out. And very interesting and, and well said too. I looking at this, I'll I'll pick a guy on both sides of the ball that really stick out to me as ones that, that aren't being talked about as much as I, I think they should be. Number one on offense, JC Treader, the center for the Packers. Uh former fourth round pick, went to Cornell, finally got on the field last year when Corey Lindsley, their starting center, went down. Played well in seven starts. He's 6'4", 305 pounds, can play in his own scheme, can play center, can play guard. If you can get this guy for five or six million a year, which I think is very reasonable, um, you, may, you know, maybe you don't even pay that much. If you can get him for five million a year, I think you can plug him in at guard, and you're also going to have flexibility 
at the center position and if and when Mike Pouncey goes down with an injury. On the defensive side of the ball, it's a position we really haven't talked about a whole heck of a lot, but at cornerback, I think one of the biggest hidden secrets in the NFL on defense is a cornerback for the Broncos by the name of Kayvon Webster, a uh, former third-round pick out of Florida, tall, fast, but he's always been locked in that number four cornerback role, has played well when given an opportunity. Adam Gase may know a little bit about him from his time in Denver. Yeah, and I'm actually going to stick with the cornerback spot as well and throw another guy out there, Alteron Herter. He was the big name to sign a couple of years ago, signed with the Bucks. Didn't quite pan out in their scheme. Got granted his uh, ability to test the market here uh, recently. And he's a guy that if he gets put back into the right scheme, he was dominant a co- just a couple of years ago. Could potentially turn into that dominant corner again and be a pleasant problem to have if, if he were to sign. And I don't think he'll be all that expensive given what happened in Tampa Bay. So he could be a guy that floats under a few radars and suddenly thrust back into the limelight. Uh, if he gets put into the right scheme moving into the season this year. Absolutely. Paul, um, before we call it a wrap on our free agent show, is there anything else you'd like to cover? No, nah, man, I, I, I'm excited. Hopefully, I, I'm torn on the fact of I'm hoping we have a need to have a show later in the week in some ways based around what moves the Dolphins have early in free agency. But I also hope Miami doesn't go out and make those big moves that, that – lead us to having another show this week because it means they probably went out and overspent on a couple of players so it's i'm a little tossed up in the air on on, uh whether hearing from us later in the week is a good or a bad thing as we move forward here me too and and because mike tannenbaum is our general manager let's also not forget the possibility that the dolphins end up with a trade of some sort i mean we looked at and nobody saw last year the dolphins moving down picking up Kiko Alonso and Byron Maxwell, which I think turned out to be a really important move in the season. And clearly the Dolphins came out ahead on that because Laramie Tunzel falls to number 13. And who knows, the Dolphins may have had Tunzel number one on their board. So with Mike Tannenbaum as general manager, it's always interesting. And so we'll keep our ears open for that. Paul, given that, we will call it a wrap. And in the words of Brian Miller, if it's not on the right side, it's not on the left side, it is on the thin side. Solo D, take us home. It ain't the left side or the right side, and it must be the fin side. It ain't the left side or the right side, and it must be the fin side. Look, listen, Dolphins fans across the land all tuning in to see what Brian, Cat, and Paul about to do again. We rep our team, you can't change, stop or ruin it.